we'll go ahead and start um, setting our motivation. Sange chodam soge chunam la janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chanyan ge pe sonam ke drola penche sange jupa sho sange chodam soge chunam la janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chanyan ge pe sonam ke drola penche sange jupa sho Sange churam sogi chunam la Janchu padu dani gapsuchi Dagi chun yangi pe sonam ki Grola penche sange ju pasho. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so, just to clarify um, and remind us, this form of tantra, green tara, is lower tantra. And there are four classes of Tantra, <clears throat> excuse me. Mostly in our tradition, we practice the lower and the highest and the middle two are less commonly practiced. The lower Tantras are mainly to, of course, achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, that goes without saying. But the immediate application of lower Tantra practices are for kind of the, the materials and resources of this life so that you can practice highest yoga tantra and perhaps become enlightened in one brief lifetime of the degenerate age. So therefore long life, therefore protection, therefore dispelling obstacles in your daily life that might interrupt your practice. And all of that with the idea that this is for enlightenment, not just for everyday ease not just for worldly happiness, but worldly happiness will be achieved as a byproduct. So that's very good news. So, you know, for example, I've just been driving for many days. There was a lot of Tara going on in my mind during icy roads through mountain passes. I'm Tara to Tara Teresa, I'm Tara to Tara Teresa. Please don't let the giant trucks hit me. Please don't let me hit a big patch of ice. But all of that is because I want to have a long, healthy life in order to practice the Dharma for the benefit of all sentient beings. So today, let's not die on the highway, you know? So it is today on the highway specific, but it's with this bigger picture always imbued. And that's what we have to remember with Tantra is that there can be a lot of clearing and a lot of movement and a lot of protection related to this life, but to what end? You know, do we want a long life just because? You know, do we want to have health and protection just because? or all those things that are gonna support our practice of the greater good of the enlightenment of all sentient beings. So the reason to practice Tantra is bodhicitta. If you have other motivations that are more prominent, like it's exotic, like it's magic, like I wanna play with my chakras, like I like smells and bells, those are not correct reasons. They can be reasons that are there incidentally, but if they are your main reason, that is a problem and it's gonna be an obstacle to your path. Yeah, John, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, question, I am gonna be volunteering soon. Uh, and I feel like I'm picking up this practice at like the perfect time. Um, so is the idea, do we know if we're practicing right or, or if our practice is moving in the right direction, if we're getting healthier, and having better relationships with people. Is that sort of how we know that Dharma is, is actually working within our lives? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, yes yeah. and no. Sometimes you get a bit of a healing crisis and it gets worse yeah. before it gets better. Um, but certainly you find that your mind is able to cope with things better than it used to. So okay. what you're trying to think is whether it's happiness or suffering, whether it's healthy, whether it's sickness, whether it's good relationships or bad, my mind is meeting that differently and better. Okay. That so how sense. is your mind meeting those things? You know, when it's happy and good, do you just kind of blob out and relax into it and think, this is great? Or do you think, oh, here's a chance. Well, things are easy to really gather more resources and learn more things and deepen my practice while well, it's easy. You know, oh, good. I've got mm -hmm. space and time to do stuff. And then when things are hard, you think, oh, right. This is the reminder of samsara always going to be bad after good and good after bad. And nothing is consistent and everything is always changing. And here is my, my reminder that stability is not possible in a samsaric existence. So let me practice in such a way that I generate renunciation and that I generate compassion for other sentient beings who suffer. So 
definitely it's a good sign if you find that you're able to have better communication with the people in your life. But it also can be confronting for the people in your life when you start to practice more sincerely because you're kind of getting out of sync with them and their worldly things. So sometimes you can actually wind up having a little bit more conflict with some of the people in your life, especially in the beginning of you getting deep with your practice. And <clears throat> the only thing I can say is to just maintain so much humility and sense of humor and self-deprecating humor that can make fun of yourself and make fun of your practice even so that you don't become like an obnoxious spiritual person who is fake plastic happy around all of your friends and family. And it seems like you're kind of, you know, stuck up. Yeah, yeah I agree. <laughs> yeah. I, I tell everybody that I'm extremely lazy. So um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I feel that way sometimes, but that's why I wanted to volunteer. It's like, how do I use this within my daily life? And it just like charged me. It was like this supercharge of energy that bodhicitta aspiration that you were talking about, I mean, it is there for me, you know, it's like, I really want to make a difference now. So I don't know, it, it's really cool. Yeah, yeah, rock on. That's fantastic. You know, manage your expectations, but ra rock on. <laughs> right. Okay. Cool. I think it's fantastic. And offering service at Dharma centers or volunteering anywhere is such a wonderful thing to do. And it almost invites chaos. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like if you're working some, you know, kind of normal job, you can kind of like get a, a habit of almost stability. You get your routines, you know, you know, these coworkers and that those coworkers, and you start to get kind of a routine when you're working at Dharma centers, because everyone is at least trying to look at their stuff. There's a lot more peaks and valleys. It's not such a little rumble. Yeah. So I'm going to be working with kids. I work with oh, kids right. at like five to 10. Yeah. So it's like yeah. teaching mindfulness and meditation. Um, <laughs> Great. In a previous life, I, I uh, was a special education teacher and I'm sort of getting back into that. I don't know. It's just, it, it's really cool to have purpose. And for sure. I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's probably too helping, simple for you yeah. guys, but. No, I think it's great. And, and I think that you're helping invite higher aspirations from the people that you work with, the little ones. Okay. Yeah. You know, and I think that that is very powerful because kids are way more profound than we give them credit to be. And then sometimes mm -hmm. they don't get that encouraged and it just kind of gets covered over and they lose it, you know, and then we don't come back to our profundity until we're, you know, old and stiff. So if you can kind of, you know, keep it alive for them um, when they're little, that's such a gift. And, okay, um, I'll do and that. Wonderful, and I'm glad you have that background in education, so you know their ways. <laughs> yes, they many many ways. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Oh yeah, you're very welcome. Um, so you know, with tantra, the the it always has to rely on the pr three principal aspects of the path, right? Every form of tantra and every situation always has to be informed by and imbued with the three principal aspects of the path or else you're taking something that is medicine and turning it into poison. Yeah. Do you remember the three principal aspects of the path? <laughs> Throw them out in any order. Uh, renunciation. Renunciation, nice one. Yep, how would you describe renunciation, David, just conversationally, how would you describe yeah, it? Yeah, just uh, renouncing worldly desires um, in this life um, so that that's not your goal anymore. Yeah. Yeah, nice. And that, that ties very well into kind of what is the definition of Dharma practice. If it is fed by and pursuing the eight worldly concerns, it's not Dharma, even if it's the outer aspect of Dharma. So it's very much as you say, you're renouncing kind of worldly pleasures in terms of that being your pursuit. So you can still have worldly pleasures, enjoy worldly pleasures, but that's not your goal in life. Yeah, they're more like side effects. Yeah, but really renunciation is the determination to be free, the determination to be free from samsara, the determination to be free from suffering. And so you're renouncing those traps that give you just like crumbs of happiness <clears throat> and kind of separate you from the cake of happiness. So renunciation is key and that's represented by Tara's lotus that she sits on and all deities are either sitting or standing on a lotus and that is not an accident, that represents renunciation. The determination to be free. Uh, what are the other two? Throw them out there, team. Compassion Boxy? and wisdom. Compassion and wisdom. 
Uh, almost. Yes, almost. wisdom for sure. Wisdom for sure. What kind of wisdom? Well, the wisdom um, that recognizes emptiness or that things are devoid of inherent existence. Yep. Or yep. that yep. don't exist in the way that we think they do. And compassion, uh, bodhicitta is not. Bodhicitta, there you go. Oh, well, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, we needed an upgrade, right? Compassion is good, but you need bodhicitta. Yeah, yeah. So those are those are them, and it's not to say that bodhicitta doesn't have compassion. Of course it does, but the 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 point we have to strike, particularly with tantra, is that my reason for these practices is Buddhahood. You know, it's not temporary ha temporary relief of suffering. It's not nirvana the state beyond suffering it's not having a good day it's not just kind of ordinary stuff it's really full enlightenment because that is the only way i can benefit sentient beings accurately and directly in an unmistaken way that doesn't cause more harm than good so we could have compassion in this moment just thinking about compassion we have a relationship with it already we're nice people you could think about compassion but it doesn't necessarily carry with it the same momentum or the same tools that come when your mind is vast enough to hold I want full enlightenment so so bodhicitta is the other one bodhicitta and wisdom as Roxy was saying correct view of emptiness of inherent existence and this sadhana is a little bit tricky because it uses the word empty in ways that sometimes mean empty empty and sometimes mean empty of inherent existence. So just be careful that whenever you're reading the word empty or emptiness, that in no situation is it ever inviting you to think of nothing. And in no situation is it ever nihilist, but it can sound that way. It can definitely sound that way. And especially when they get kind of poetic about it, you're like, oh, the vast void. That sounds like absolutely nothing whatsoever you know, don't go too far with it. Think of it as space of infinite possibility or potentiality. Yeah, so it's not implying anything in its place, the lack of inherent existence, but it's also not implying absence of anything altogether. So this is a big piece to always remember. So the three principal aspects of the path are the heart of all tantric practice of any level. And um, sometimes you can see the sun and sometimes you can't, depending on the artist's rendering. But um, you can see that she's seated on a moon disc representing Bodhicitta. And sometimes you'll be able to see a little sliver of the sun. This one you can't. Um, and that represents the correct view of emptiness. So here is your Tara. And <clears throat> we'll go through all of the different bits and pieces later. But just so you know, renunciation, correct view, Bodhicitta, these three are the very important ones to remember in all tantric practice. Okay, so Kriya Tantra as opposed to Highest Yoga Tantra. Highest Yoga Tantra Tara is named Chittamani Tara. And the main way you can tell the difference between her and regular Tara in terms of the iconography is that green Tara has one little lotus by her ear. Chittamani Tara has two. Otherwise they look just the same. Yeah, uh, let's see, I've got a picture of, um, here's Chittamani Tara. See how she's got two flowers? one by either shoulder. Yeah, and then um, green Tara, she just has one. Yep, just one. Okay, so that's how you'll know when you're looking at the iconography. And often the artists themselves don't even really know and they might just be like, I like Tara, you know, and they're just putting lotuses all over the place because they're pretty. But <laughs> if you've got a, a technically precise Tonka painter, they'll do it in that way. Okay. So the practice starts with a review of the stages of the path to enlightenment. And not all sadhanas do this in an elaborate way, but it's always encouraged that before you do any practice, you do some sort of lam rim something, some sort of stages of the path something, even if it's just very abbreviated, uh, like a prayer, like the foundation of all good qualities, which is like a page and a half long. It's, you know, something short. But what it's doing is it's refreshing the steps that lead you to Tantra, which lead you to enlightenment. And so you're not leaving anything out and you're also kind of letting the topics build on one another and inform the whole practice, 
even though you're not holding them all simultaneously in your mind, like squeezing it all in there, it's like you've had teachings on these here and there over time, and you're kind of waking them up. Yeah, you're waking them up. And also it might be that as you read through a Lamrim prayer, you get stuck and you think, actually, that sentence never makes sense to me. Maybe I need to ask for teachings on that section. So it can be also a helpful way to kind of remind you what you need to double check on. Okay, so we'll just kind of briefly go through it as is in the Sadhana itself. Uh, and this particular version of the text is um, from the FPMT, the Foundation for the Preservation of the Mahayana Tradition. And the short practice of Green Tara, it's suitable for people who are beginners as well as those who have the empowerment. So Lama Zopa Rinpoche and Lama Yeshi composed this particular version. So the practice requirements, this is always good to check whenever you're looking at um, any of these sadhanas, any of these practice manuals. It says one needs a Kriya Tantra empowerment of green Tara, which is sometimes called a Jainong, to practice this sadhana in full. However, one can do the practice without such an empowerment, as long as one does not generate oneself as the deity. If one does not have the empowerment, one can do the self-generation practice at the crown of one's head. And it's also fine to do in the space in front. These are um, helpful hints. If you have many empowerments, but not this one, most teachers will say, still don't see yourself as the deity until you have this specific empowerment. And I'm using the word empowerment and initiation interchangeably as synonyms. There is a difference between levels of empowerment. That's kind of a conversation for another day. But basically, if you've never been in the room with a llama with this picture and a whole bunch of smells and bells for the day, you probably haven't had the empowerment. But you can still do the practice. So when you do the practice without the empowerment, just make sure that you're placing Tara here or Tara here, that you never at any point think, I am Tara. That's something that only comes when you have the empowerment, okay? So what you're developing in that case is aspiration, but you're also developing a strong sense that your Buddha nature is really there. It's not that you're a Buddha yet and you need to wake up to it. It's not that simplistic, but the seed for your own enlightenment has been there from the beginning of time, even though time has no beginning, because your mind lacks inherent existence. It has always lacked inherent existence, which means it can always change. It can always be transformed. And that all the negative states of mind are adventitious or additional, they're extra, they're removable. So your Buddha nature is a better place to put your identity than your afflictions, than your personality, than your abilities, than anything that you relate to as identity is much more surface than your Buddha nature. So even before you have the empowerment to change your identification from your name and your personality and your things of this life to your potentiality is actually closer to the truth. And it's a very good practice to kind of bring it forefront into your daily life rather than operating with this kind of identification with all of your mistakes and all of your capabilities and all of your education and all of your whatever or your body or something, those are all newer. Your Buddha nature has been there the whole time. Okay, so then if you do have the empowerment, you're at some point in the sadhana towards the end, you adopt divine pride and clear appearance, but it actually doesn't come until quite later in the sadhana, the sadhana being the practice manual, right? So in the beginning, what you're doing is mainly a purification practice. And you're purifying body and you're purifying speech and you're purifying mind, very similar to how you would in a Vajrasattva practice, for example. But in this way, it's somehow both more direct and more gentle in the way the visualization is orchestrated. It's a really beautiful way to go about it. So that comes later. And then once you're purified, you arise as Tara or Tara in front. And basically you're sending out purifying light to all sentient beings, turning them into Taras. And then you're sending out offerings to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, not because they need offerings, but because you need merit, yeah? And then all the light gathers back and blesses your body, speech, and mind. 
and you just kind of keep going through that visualization of light going out doing this, light going out doing that, light coming back blessing you. And that kind of in and out motion, you can do as slowly or as quickly as feels comfortable to you while you recite the mantra, Om Tari Tutari Tari Soha. Yeah, John, go ahead. What if we're really bad at visualization? Like that is just not a strength. I have a traumatic brain injury and it's like, that's tough for me to like focus, but I, I think it's good. I think it's very good practice for me to, I do it, you know, intermittently here and there, but if we're not what able to do green? it for- What about just green light? How's just green light? I can do just green light, yeah. Just green light is a good place to start. There's, there's okay. two things that could be happening. One is your case where it's difficult. The other is that you simply cannot at all. And there, are okay. a, there is a small percentage of the population that simply cannot visualize. And that is okay, they are not a lost cause. But for someone like you who can visualize, but it's just hard, just gently weave in more and more detail. And what'll happen is that for all of us, it doesn't matter how, how good a visualizer we are, we're gonna have various random obstacles in the visualization process. For us that have been around Dharma centers for many years, we've seen pictures of Tara thousands of times, but then we close our eyes and try to visualize her. And you're like, wait, what are her hands doing? What are her legs doing? But we've seen her a million times. Why can't we visualize? Some of it is lack of merit. Some of it is obscurations. Some of it is just tension and pressure. Some of it is not knowing kind of practical ways to visualize. So to, to kind of unpack that a little bit, you have to think about something in your life that you can visualize, okay? So something in your life that you can visualize is perhaps your cutlery drawer in your kitchen or the dashboard of your car or the cover of your favorite book or the pattern of your favorite shirt something is there something simple in your everyday life that when it's not in front of you you can bring it to your mind's eye with a fair amount of detail my dog yeah your dog yeah right and his yeah. sweet little face right exactly <laughs> right that's actually a fair amount of detail eyes nose yeah. mouth tongue you know color of fur um size shape color that's actually a fair amount and why can you visualize your cute puppy dog and not tara you see your dog more often and you have a more relaxed mind when you see them. That makes sense. But yeah. part of it is the relaxed mind and part of it is the familiarity, two things. So this is kind of something for all of us to work on is you pick a picture of Tara that you like the artist's rendering of. Yeah, there's a million pictures of Tara, find one that you like the artist's rendering of and then just kind of stare at it and go, <sighs> <laughs> yeah. And don't try to do anything other than just kind of look at it and be happy. <laughs> yeah. Look at it and be happy. And then you close your eyes and bring it to your mind's eye. And it might be hazy and fuzzy in a general kind of outline. And you open your eyes again and look at details, close your eyes, bring them back. And basically what you're trying to do is hold enough detail that your mind feels sharp and clear but not force so much detail that your mind goes into tension. So if you start getting bored with your level of visualization, that kind of means you can add in more elaboration. Yeah, Helen, go ahead. Um, yeah, I was just wondering whether it matters um, because you are saying there's the Kriya Yoga with the two lotuses or the, the lower one with the, does, does that matter a lot? You know, if, if we don't have the um, empowerment, does it matter mm. if you if you have that, that image with the two lotuses? Is that a problem? With, it's, a, it's a good question because in a case like Tara, the difference is so minor. It doesn't seem to make a difference, but it does seem like a very good practice to when in doubt, always use the Kriya lower action tantra form of a deity. Yeah, the highest Uga Tantra version of the deities for something like Manjushri, you know, lower Tantra Manjushri with the sword and he's orange and beautiful and all that, highest yoga Tantra version of Manjushri is Yamantaka. 
so the difference is very obvious you know yeah. suddenly he's got nine faces and 34 yeah. arms and 16 legs and it's like it's a lot right yeah. the difference between Yamantaka and Manjushri is very obvious and so you would of course only do Manjushri if you don't have the empowerment yeah. but with Tara it's like it doesn't really make a difference visually but maybe mentally it's a better exercise mm. to just kind of stick with the simpler version that we're permitted to do just to kind of prevent obstacles in the future. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. So gently, gently. Yeah, Eleanor, go ahead. Um, I was thinking about the purification process of the beginning of the pro pro of the um, practice. And it happened, it comes up for me quite a bit is they say all our obscurations are purified and, you know, and, and yet in other teachings, we have so many eons of obstacles and lack of merit and I kind of can't get into my head that all the obstacles are purified I mean can you I don't know if I'm making sense or not yeah, totally. but I just wondered if you could answer you could talk well, about that a little bit please I, I will um how do you go with Vajrasattva at the end of Vajrasattva when you think all yeah. negative karma has been purified do you have the same yeah. problem yeah, yeah. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Basically, anytime the sadhana says, and now you're done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you think, and yes. no, I'm not. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, that sounds great, yeah. but I feel doubt. <laughs> right. Mm. And, yeah. um, and the sadhanas all need commentary, right? Like, these practices, as they're written, they all are built to have explanation. So that's why, you know, it's one of the many reasons why we like empowerments, one of the many reasons why you need oral teachings, is that a lot of these things will be missed if you just read it. So I'm glad you asked. Um, it's, again, this tantric attitude of taking the result as the path, taking the finished product as the present moment, it's the path. taking mm -hmm. what will be as what is. And it's a mental exercise that you try and adopt that attitude even for just a few seconds. Just a few seconds, what would that be like? What is the possibility of that? Can I visualize that future? And can I bring it into this moment? It's a little bit like when you're a little kid and what will I be when I grow up and you think oh, I'm gonna be a doctor and you think of yourself all grown up as a doctor. You know, the sort of potentiality for you as a grown up being with a doctor is there already with you as a child, but you're still a little sprout. You know, you haven't grown into it yet, but it's not like that potentiality isn't there. It's there, it just hasn't been watered and grown and fertilized. I'm mixing metaphors, you know what I mean though, yeah? Yep. So, so what you're trying to do is to not squash your doubt, not throw away your doubt, but to think in this moment, I'm adopting an attitude about the future. I do believe that future is possible. Why do I believe what? that future is possible? I know the mind is trainable. I know that my negative states are removable. I know that afflictions can be ended. And even if you haven't ended them yet, you know that you're more patient than you once were. You know that you're kinder than you once were. A change has happened already in your life that you've been able to gauge. And so that gives you confidence that that fully finished product of your mind is going to be something you can do. Does that Thank make sense? You. That makes, that's very clear. Thank you. Yeah. So it's, it's you. like um, His Holiness <laughs> calls it ripening through rehearsal. So you're rehearsing your Buddhahood. You're rehearsing your Buddhahood, just like you're rehearsing a music piece. And again and again, you rehearse what it will be until that's what it is. And you're also rehearsing, thinking of everyone else in that state as well, even though as soon as you talk to someone, you're going to stop believing that. <laughs> yeah, as soon as they open their mouth, you're going to be like, you are not Tara. <laughs> you know? But if you're adopting this attitude, it actually does invite better qualities from you and better qualities from them. So there's that also, that side piece. It's interesting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, John, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, going off of that exercise you were just talking about, um, it's like an, it sounds like an aspirational thing. Um, it is, okay, so the idea is we, can we pick something external? Like, let's say, for example, every day I wake up and I'm like, I wanna be president of the United States. Even though I know, logically, I'm never going to be president of the United States, it still feels good to say that. You know what I mean? <laughs> so is that, is that a cool way to practice or would you not recommend doing it that way? 
it's it's delicate because it can it can start to slide into like 1995 yeah. positive thinking i'm good enough i'm smart enough doggone it people like me looking in the mirror think you know like it can get really cheesy really quickly totally cringy um you know kind of pop psychology positive thinking very yeah. easily and and it's so much more profound than that but it can start to sound like that if you're missing the experiential aspect so I think, you know, take a few steps back and really, you know, think about yourself on your best day in your best moment when you have space and time to accommodate people in all of their madness. You know, those days that you feel grounded and clear and you can cope, you can cope with whatever is happening. Okay. When, you know, when people are rude, it's fine, it rolls off you. You're not disassociated. You're present with their rudeness, but it doesn't get to you. You haven't personalized it. And then when you're offering support to people, whether they appreciate it or not, you're just happy to do it. You know, you just kind of like think of some moment in time in your life when you feel you're most together so far. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of adopt the attitude that that's your starting point for your enlightenment. Okay. You know, that those qualities show you that those qualities exist. But also, you know, that those qualities are not there all the time. You're not always that yeah. guy who is patient and accommodating and kind. Sometimes you lose your temper. Sometimes you get depressed, whatever happens. But you know, those qualities exist. They just need to be grown. Okay. So it's more like the attitude you take when you're exercising. So you visualize how strong your body could be. And then you just start with a low weight that's going to be resistance, but not pain. Can I ask one more follow-up question? Sure. So I read Shanti Deva's um, Way of the Bodhisattva, and I think it was the translation by Pima Chodron. I don't know if I'm oh, pronouncing yeah, that Pima correctly. Children. Yeah. Oh, love her. She's amazing. Um, True. I completely forgot where. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. My mind went blank, guys. No, um, can I? Can you guys come back to me? I apologize. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, we'll come back to you. No worries. Yeah, okay. Roxy, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say I was just reading that too, John. No time to lose is the name of the book. Yeah. Um, yeah, the beautiful translation. My question for you is um, twofold. I just uh, recently went to a flea market in Santa Cruz and I bought a picture of what I think is the white Tara. And I understand that practice of not really confirming the legitimacy of a painting, you know, by who does it and so forth is problematic, but I was really drawn to it. And she's I guess it's white Tara. She looks like white Tara, but um, so she's on a swan and she has a lute. And I was trying to look up the iconography of that and nothing was coming Saraswati. up. Saraswati. What is it? Saraswati. Oh, Young Saraswati? Kimmel. Oh, so it's not white Tara. Nope, it's the girl version of Manjushri. Ew. She's a Buddha of wisdom. Thank you. That's really helpful. So, um, but also huh. great. Also great. Okay. <laughs> There's no right. Dharmakaya competition. No Dharmakaya competition. All right. Um, but that I but I sort of have a little mental love affair going with white tar. So I'm gonna, I'm working with that <laughs> feeling now. Um, and I'm wondering if you could describe in terms of Korea, maybe verse of Chittam, Chittamani, if there is a kind of uh, not not exactly a um, hierarchy, but maybe a maybe a ascension of qualities that come from green and then go to white. I mean, I associate with white Tara, long life and action. And maybe you could just say a few words if you feel like it um, mm -hmm. about the distinction between the qualities of each one. I mean, I've read about them, but I also am hearing like long, I'll read that long life is also affiliated with green, but I, I usually affiliate it with white uh, Tara, right? Long well, life. it's, they are equal. Um... It's a little bit like, you know, if you are, you know, a school teacher and you have many students, some of your students need you to be funny and silly. Some uh -huh. of your students need you to be strict and decisive. Some of your students need a little bit of wrath, but it's all you and qualities you have. Yeah, it's not like you're changing hats or changing faces. It's all in the spectrum of who you are. 
And it's just that certain students need certain things. And so similarly, like the folk story of White Tara and Green Tara, some of you know, is there was, you know, Chen Rezig and he was going to Tibet and he realized that Tibetans were totally unruly and they weren't practicing Dharma. And he was getting so sad that he couldn't get through to them that he cried. And from his green face came a green tear that became Green Tara. And from his white face came a white tear that became White Tara, Ping! you know, and there they are. And so they're equal. Um, in the folk story, yes. But think of it like this. Think of the enlightened mind of a Buddha being like a drop in the ocean. And all drops in the ocean are equal, but they're still individual drops. Yeah, and so then there's waves that come and some crash and some are sweet and small, but they're all of water, yeah. And so the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas is like that. and then they take the aspect or the shape and the size mm. to suit the specific sentient beings who need that aspect. So mm. the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas is manifesting as white Tara for you, Roxy, because you need that presentation. Yeah, you need those eyes of wisdom in her palms and feet. You need that aspect of robust, vital, long life and youthful energy that's suiting your mind and the trend that your mind is already going in your path. So it's like, because of beginningless time, but countless habits and lifetimes, we have developed kind of personality types for lack of a better word, we would say a Buddha family that we belong to. Yeah, and because of that, you know, they're all equal, but we might as well go with where we're already trending. Yeah, because that's where the momentum and the flow is. So when you go into a gompa, all of us have that experience of, I like those pictures more than those pictures, or I'm more interested in these images than those images. Even though they're all perfect, you have an affinity. Go with the affinity that you already have. Yeah. I like the way that you characterized it as a folk story i mean and then my mind went immediately to how so many female deities or deity figures come out of a man like whether or not it's eve out of the rib of adam or even you know slightly more violently athena sorry of aphrodite mm. out of the um throne sorry everybody testicles of Kronos, who is defeated by zeus you know and i really love the actual um iconography of tears of compassion coming out of Avalokiteshvara is so much better. So thank you for putting that image into my mind. Well, and it's like, that's what he needed more than what he had. He needed more than what he was doing. And so then, then these came because action. Yeah. And it's more feminist. Thank you. Yeah, it is. And, you know, if you want to go straight to the most feminist of all feminist deities, go to Prajna Paramita, the mother of all Buddhas you know, the heart of wisdom. So, you know, it's, so it's, it's this delicate thing. And, you know, in the folk story of Green Tara specifically, when she was in human aspect, you know, and, you know, practicing on the path, different people came to her and said, why don't you practice in a male body? Male bodies are more conducive to practice. You have more strength, you have more safety, you have more resources. And she said, the Dharmakaya mind of the Buddha is genderless and genderful. But because not many people adopt the aspect of a woman, I'm going to, because y'all need to see it. Yeah, and you need to be inspired by it. So, so Buddhas have no gender. They take the aspect of a gender for our sake, because we're used to relating to gender. But in Tantra particularly, we're looking at the unification of masculine and feminine. And we're looking at the unification of wisdom and method. And we're looking at overcoming the duality of our mind in a million different ways, which means that one day we practice Tara, one day we practice Manjushri and we get into that flexibility of mind that is no longer identifying with this gross, fleshy, coarse thing born of karma and disturbing emotions. We're identifying with our Buddha nature and then its resultant form. So it, it kind of helps you break down all of those barriers that we create for ourselves, while still acknowledging that we're used to operating within those systems. Does that make sense? It's like you're getting flexible, but you're also saying, okay, for now I'm gonna be a lady, but a green one, there are no green ones in real life. That's weird. <laughs> Now I'm going to be a boy, but an orange one, I don't know any orange ones, you know, it's still helping you overcome ordinary appearance and grasping, 
but also a fluidity of working within the frameworks that we already know. Tantra is, is super cool, you guys, really. It's layers upon layers of looking at identity and challenging identity, becoming free of identity while still using one. It's, it's brilliant. No, it is brilliant. And that was such a cool explanation. And I'm, anyways, my question was about uh, Shanti Deva. And one of the things that I really connected with when I was reading that was this idea that we should be, we should use mindfulness as like a, a tool and be a sentinel of what's going on inside of us. Mm -hmm. So I tend to go in the opposite direction. I tend to simplify everything. And when I tell kids, it's like I work with kids that have intellectual disabilities sometimes. Um, what I'll say to them is something very simple, like, are we keeping our emotions from becoming bigger problems? Or are we keeping small problems from becoming bigger problems? Is that a fair trans, like transmission of the Dharma to a child to simplify mm. it that much? Or is it, do you yeah. know what I mean? Do you what I'm yeah, okay. no, I would trust yourself. You, you are a more of an expert of children than me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like them, I give them stories and then I make craft projects with them. And then I send them on their way to their parents and take a nap because they exhaust me. But I am impressed that you can deal with the tiny creatures. They're adorable. I love them. I love them. <laughs> They are. They're fantastic. And when I used to have a kids group, I did do similarly. But what I, you know, it was a lot more and I don't know if this works for you. But it was a lot more modeling behaviors I wanted to see in them rather than telling okay. them. So for example, I would do craft projects where I would say, um, listen to each other and draw a picture for each other. You know, so one would say, I want a picture of a dragon. So this one would draw a picture of a dragon for that one. I want a picture of a tiger. So he'd draw a picture of a, a tiger for that one. And uh, what I was modeling is you have to listen to each other and it's more fun to do something for someone else than to just do what you want. You know, but I'm not gonna um, like force feed them that. I'm gonna show them that by an activity. Okay. And then afterwards, so you know, they were way more chill at lunch and didn't push in line so much. But if I said, don't push in line so much, they're, who cares, right? They don't care. It never works. It never works. Exactly, no, I appreciate it. Right? Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Good for that. But uh, yes, like this. So, so with Tantra, I think that, you know, when we're doing this particular sadhana, what we're doing is twofold. We're connecting to something within us and we're connecting to something outside of us. And outer and inner is a long conversation of philosophical tenets that we don't have time for. But what you're wanting to do at the very beginning is after you've done that connection with the Lam Rim and you've done the connection with Refuge and Bodhicitta, then you visualize the guru. And visualizing the guru in this sense, it's kind of a Lama Tsongkhapa-esque aspect. You don't have to visualize Lama Tsongkhapa if that's not your tradition or your affiliation, but you're wanting to really, not necessarily the flesh and blood form, you want something a little bit more light and spacious and transparent in your guru visualization. And part of that is so that you don't get trapped in the personality of your specific guru right now, you're trying to think more spaciously of the guru-ness of all of the Buddhas and that they all kind of get represented by and take this form of Lama Tsongkhapa on the crown of your head, surrounded by rainbow light, okay? So again, visualization will come gradually over time, don't force it. But what you're trying to relate to is the quality that happens when you finally could hear something, okay? So people have given you advice and people have taught you things in your life. Some of it bounces right off, some of it sinks in. Yeah. Sometimes when someone speaks wisdom to you, it resonates with your wisdom and wakes it up and elevates it. It's like you were 90% there and they close the gap of that final 10%, that feeling. You know that feeling when someone has said something to you with the ring of truth. And it's not like it had the ring of truth because they were the grand truth teller. It was that you had a bell to ring and they went, Dong! right? So we could have Shakyamuni Buddha right in front of us explaining everything perfectly clearly, but if we don't have a connection with him and receptivity to him, it just goes in one ear out the other. So what you're trying to do with this visualization and this practice is to think of the quality of the relationship when you've finally been able to listen and receive and take on board, quote, external wisdom. Yeah. And you think that that relationship 
is embodied by that image. Yeah, and you're connecting to that, the guru-ness. Yeah. And it could be a con conglomeration or a combination of every teacher who has ever touched you in your whole life. They say sometimes even choose the teacher who taught you the alphabet. You know, it doesn't have to be a Dharma teacher. Or Lama Zopa Rinpoche would say, even if it's a kangaroo, if it moved your mind towards the Dharma, you know, it's a kangaroo, no problem. Doesn't matter. You're trying to touch something deeper than the personality that gave it to you. Um, have you had this experience in Dharma classes where there's a teacher coming and they explain things and afterwards people are talking and they say, weren't they amazing? They explained it so clearly. Now I finally understand. And you think, yeah, but that other teacher explained it last week and it was perfectly clear then. You know, it was about the receptivity. It was about the karmic connection. It was about countless conditions coming together for wisdom to be heard and resonated with. So when we're talking about the guru, you can think about the actual people who are gurus, but go deeper than that to the relationship and that resonance and take to think that that takes form and that's what you're connecting to. In the Zen tradition, they often say, see everyone as your teacher, right? Which is not the same as Tantra, but is going in that direction. Because if you're seeing everyone as your teacher, you're listening for wisdom from everyone and you're receptive to wisdom from anyone, whether they're consciously conveying it to you or not, whether they want to help you or not, you're making that for yourself. It's a powerful tool. So similarly, if you start there, you become open and receptive and then you're bringing it in and then eventually merging with and integrating with it. I've practiced um, Theravada Buddhism for about 14 years. Recently did a, the, um, um, a Nam Gyama retreat mm -hmm. and I was very lost about the visualization of the guru because you know idea where to go with that and what I think I'm hearing you say is that the guru is basically anybody that we resonate with that we've learned dharma from ish okay yeah 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 mm -hmm. and so that's who we can visualize now is that the same thing as a root guru because that's what they were asking for there there's levels so you're not actually visualizing a person that you've seen you're thinking of people that you've seen who you've learned things from and that quality that they embody and you think of that quality as taking the form of lama sankapa um, so, you know, kind of like plug in all of those qualities into your Lama Tsongkhapa visualization. So it's going to look like this. Yeah, this is the visualization above the crown of your head, facing the same direction as you, about the size of your hand. Okay. And even if it's a lot more vague than this, even if the details aren't clear, that's completely fine. What you're really doing is tuning into the energy of teacher and the energy of you as student able to hear that. When we talk about gurus technically and root gurus specifically, we're talking about a formal relationship that's happened where you've asked a real live person, can I be your student? And the real life person has said, yes, yes, you can. And there's probably been a, either a casual conversation or a formal ceremony and you've cemented that bond meaning that they are going to take care of you for the rest of this life and you are going to rely on them for the rest of your life. And that's a sutra level guru disciple relationship. Once you make that relationship, you train in hearing everything they say as direct advice for you from the Buddha, as if they're the representative or the mouthpiece of the Buddha for you. You train in that, but you don't have to be as literal about it as you are in the tantric view. In the tantric view, they're not the representative of the Buddha, they are the Buddha. So then there's an elevated ceremony to make that teacher a more elevated relationship with you. There's more qualities that you need to check beforehand. There's a longer time period of sussing out, theoretically, right? Theoretically, where you're seeing they have stable ethics, they have superior concentration, they have amazing wisdom. And I've watched that over time to see consistency. I haven't heard scary 
stories about them, I don't know, embezzling money or womanizing or, you know, the classic tale of what people do with power, you know, and you're, you know, doing your good sussing out. And then you take on this tantric relationship where at least during the Sadhana time, you think that they are literally the Buddha. Some people even train in seeing them as the Buddha outside of meditation session time and become so literal that even a sneeze or a cough is a teaching for them. Do with that information what you like. There's many schools of thought about that. I recommend teachings by His Holiness the Dalai Lama on guru devotion for the most clarity, but your choice. The root guru is one that you've taken a highest yoga tantra empowerment from, and you can have more than one, but um, highest yoga tantra empowerments um, make someone your root guru or one of your root gurus. Colloquially, it just might mean your closest one, the one who resonates with you the most, but technically that's what it means. Okay. Did that help or did that make it more complicated? Kind of both. Right. <laughs> but, you know, this is all new to me and it's like you, you were sharing earlier that sometimes it takes hearing it a, a few different ways from a few different people because you'll get this piece from here and this piece from here and then, you know, and then eventually it makes this full picture that all of a sudden you go, ah, but you know, so yeah, so I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I had one other quick question. Can you please repeat the, what we're supposed to do, the, the Lam Rim practice, there was a, um, a sequence of events before doing the Sadhana? Yeah, and that's built right into this sadhana, so you don't have to think about it too much. It's built right in. So right okay. when you get to the start, see, there's the actual practice, which has the Lamrim built in. Fun okay. fact, there's a great commentary at the bottom of this text you guys might want to read in the break. But basically, it starts, it says the actual practice, a glance meditation on the graduated path. The graduated path is Lamrim. Yeah, graduated path Lamrim just means graduated path in Tibetan. Wow. So here are, so you're touching these and then you go into small scope or initial scope and you go into middle scope or medium capability. And then you go into great scope or Mahayana and then you upgrade into Vajrayana. And these are just touching those motivations, gradually layering them until you get to the highest motivation. And then you start the visualization. So it's built right into the sadhana, thank goodness. You don't have to think about it. It's just that when you do other practices, it might not be written right in there. So you might wanna bring in a Lamrim prayer like the three principal aspects of the path or like the foundation of all good qualities and do those first before you start the sadhana, just to kind of reinforce all of the stages of the path. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. And this sadhana will get more clear over time. You know, it's only your first go. So it'll become like your old friend um david go ahead thanks trish thank you yeah thank you Jansen. venerable um so when i do visualizations i don't hold those visualizations very stable it's more just kind of like a fleeting image that comes pretty sharp but then it dissipates and it's usually replaced with a feeling mm -hmm. um i have found that i'm pretty good at generating a feeling so when you were just talking about um when you're visualizing the guru, um, what I kind of understood is that the feeling that I'll generate is that feeling of receiving wisdom, um, like you were saying. Yeah. So my question is, um, how important is it for me to not kind of jump ahead and get to that feeling part? Because I mean, I can hold that feeling very strong and I can sit with that for a very long amount of time. But I wonder if I'm somehow like skipping a step by not working too much on my visualization ability. Yeah, it's a good question. And it kind of ties into one of the unique features of Tantra. In the Sutra tradition, we develop calm abiding, single pointed concentration, shamatha as one skill set. And then we develop insight, vipassana, analytical meditation as a different skill set. And within one session, we might alternate between the two, but usually we do them as separate practices. And we need them both. And eventually we integrate them both, you know, in the path of preparation, we want the union of calm abiding and special insight focused on emptiness, et cetera, right? But generally they're two skills. In Tantra, we're trying to develop them simultaneously. And of course we can't do it simultaneously yet at our level, but we adopt this attitude as if we can, just like we're taking the result on the path, 
we're also thinking we're integrating calm abiding and special insight simultaneously from the very outset, which means thinking and feeling at the same time as visualizing. And it might be that you alternate and then you have moments where it feels like they kind of come together and then they dissipate and then they come together and you just keep trying to bring them together. So the visualization is important. One for purifying ordinary appearance and grasping at the, as at this body born from delusion and the grasping at an inherent existence that we have, but also it's just really good for concentration. The visualization really supports concentration. So if you feel like one side is coming more easily, that's wonderful, it's not a problem, but make sure you give effort to the other side, which is stabilize the visualization. So if it's a fleeting image, just see if you can get it a little bit longer, even if it's just a few seconds at a time, a little longer, a little longer. Yeah. Okay, so- Actually bring them together. Are you saying that, like, cause I mean, I, I consider my sitting with a feeling to be calm abiding in that feeling. Um, so what do you thoughts needed on a great, that? Did you need some analysis to get to that feeling? It doesn't take long. Like, I mean, I, I feel like that feeling um, comes very quickly. Like when, like, you know, you visualize like light yeah. coming into you and filling you with all good qualities. I feel that very strongly. Um, and I don't really have to think about that analytically, but maybe I'm, maybe I should think more about it analytically. Um, I mean, if it's going quite quickly, you know, as if like in the beginning, when you're going through the long rim, if you're having a connection with the motivation of the small scope, and then a connection with the feeling of the medium scope, and then a, con you know, a real connection with each, the words are to get you into a connection. Mm -hmm. So it's like before you have a connection, you rely more and more heavily on the words to try and evoke a connection with those concepts. But once you have that connection, you can just kind of tap into them. So that is true in that one sense. But in terms of actual visualizing, another piece of Tantra is that you're using your senses for you rather than against you. Right mm -hmm. now, our distractions are very much sensorial. We want to see things that are entertaining. We want to taste things that are delicious. We want to hear things that are pleasant. And those are the objects of our distraction. So if during the tantric meditation, you can visualize something that came from the enlightened mind and stabilize on it while thinking of things that came from the enlightened mind, while verbally reciting enlightened speech, while physically holding prayer beads as a tactile representation, hearing the mantra in your mind's ear, all of your senses become absorbed in virtue rather than challenges of your focus. Hmm. So it's like if as much as possible, you can weave in things to do with each of the senses, your, your motivation and your meditation are gonna be more powerful. But don't overwhelm yourself because right in the beginning, especially, it's going to be alternating. Like you're going to stabilize visualization and then it'll kind of fade and you'll stabilize mantra and it'll keep going, but kind of fade. And then you, you know, revive or refresh your analysis and it'll fade as long as you're staying absorbed in practice. Basically, bad practice is if you get distracted and allow it. Everything else is going the right direction effort of any kind towards enlightenment is going the right direction. So whatever you're touching into, as long as it's not fading into like subtle laxity of this is just easy and warm and comfortable and doesn't confront me in any way. And so I'm just going to stay in this hazy dreamland of being in the lap of my guru. That could become a problem if it's like too vague. Yeah. yeah. So you want spacious, but you don't want spacey. You want relaxed, but you don't want vague. Yeah. And you want clear and focused, but without any kind of stress with it. And so kind of hitting the right balance of those things, you just kind of want a really flexible mind that experiments with what happens if I emphasize this part for a while and then weave in this and weave in that and layer it in. Yeah. Great. So this Thank very so simple much. practice has so many layers. Yeah. Yeah, and it'll come clear over time, but just mm -hmm. you gradually build elaboration. And I think the most important thing to realize about like when it's familiar enough for you to get bored, that, that yeah. amount familiar, boredom is a sign that you have space opening up to add more detail and to I add like more depth. 
Yeah, so rather than it being a problem, it's like an invitation to add more depth. And if you're not bored, if you're overwhelmed and you're like, oh, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do this, <sighs> simplify and just keep one thing, even if it's just compassion, green light, that's it. <laughs> you know, keep it really simple. Or just the mantra and you're trying to get your mouth around it. You're like, om tare, tu tare, tare, so ha, tare, tu tare, you know, and that's all you can do. It's fine. Yeah. So awesome. not too tight, not too loose. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, John, go ahead and then we'll um, have a little lunch break. I appreciate it. Would you ever recommend someone take up a Zen practice? The reason I ask is because Zen, my understanding, and it, I'm very new to all of this, so, but it's like Zen is more like stripping away. Like we don't want to add. We want to just continue to strip and strip away until we get to a place where, you know, you have that real, you're, you're, you're there. Um, mm -hmm. Would you ever recommend, because I've, I've experimented with both. I've done visualiz visualiz visualization stuff um, and Zen stuff. And I, I feel like I'm making more progress in the Zen direction right now, but I could easily see how, it's, it's the idea just to continue to be nimble and flexible with our own practice and kind of just weave in and out is, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, look, and the thing is, is the Buddha taught all of these techniques, but he yeah. taught them with the understanding that you know, different strokes for different folks. So uh -huh. you're gonna have more of an affinity with one style than another. And it's not like a choice of hierarchy, it's a choice of style and inclination. Okay. So I started in the Zen tradition um, and I moved to the Tibetan tradition and then moved to the Vajrayana because for me, more elaborate, elaboration meant more focus and more depth. But for some okay. people, their minds are so hyper analytical constantly that they need to simplify and simplify and simplify. For some very, very analytical people, organizing that analysis into tidy compartments is also useful. So it's really an exercise of self-awareness and you can cross-fertilize, you can use different traditions, but in the beginning particularly, I think it's good to get very clear on the techniques and the vocabulary of one okay. tradition. The, tone, the techniques and the vocabulary, because we use vocabulary slightly differently in the different traditions. Even the same words might mean something slightly different. And then the techniques might have a slightly different goal or a slightly different kind of, um, I guess, progression. Mm -hmm. And so they're good, they're all good, but kind of know one very, very well and then cross fertilize if it feels like your tradition could use a bit more zhuzhing in one area or another for lack of a better word. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And of course, in the beginning, if you wanna shop around to see what's your affinity, that's fine too. But at some point land and commit because then you're not reinventing the wheel and you can actually get some forward momentum rather than just kind of be all over the place. Okay, so we'll have, um, is an hour break long enough for folks? Yeah, hour break for lunch. Sorry, Australia and New Zealand. I know it is not lunchtime. <laughs> okay, so I'll see you in an hour. Thanks, everyone.